Good afternoon, and I want to thank the organizers for having inviting, invited me here today. And what I want to talk to um, about today alludes a little bit to what Gunny was talking about this morning uh, in terms of authenticity, Gunny being a great proponent of authenticity of materials, which of course is incredibly important. But we're going to look at two very um, different Frank Lloyd Wright case studies, um, Falling Water and the Guggenheim, both of which I had the, the great good fortune or maybe the great headache of actually working on. In fact, Bob Selman was involved with both projects, um, as was uh, Norman Weiss, so I should just men mention that. Uh, Falling Water, of course, is the iconic uh, weekend home of uh, the Kaufman family who were uh, Pitts Pittsburgh uh, department store magnates. Um, this was their weekend home in uh, southeast of Pittsburgh, uh, about the 60 miles southeast. So it's, it's a schlep to get there. It's in the middle of nowhere in the highland laurels uh, in the mountains. Um, and of course, it's famous building, well known, incredibly iconic. Uh, this was the building that really kind of put Frank Lloyd Wright back on the map as, as a modernist architect, uh, which he had not really previously been thought about as, even though when you go to the Roby House, it's very clear that in 1904 he was miles ahead of everybody else. Um, it's a concrete structure, but today what I'm going to talk about are the metal materials that uh, were conserved as part of this project and some replicated. So obviously one of the famous uh, images is this with it standing over the waterfall um, and of course the steel windows and, and doors, which uh, Frank Lloyd Wright himself said it's the first time they came within uh, residential use, that they could actually use them residentially and it's famous for not having corner mullions. And some of it just dies right into, um, I think you can probably see the arrow, right into the stone walls. So these were relatively problematic. Um, you can see at the doors and um, not so uh, necessarily the operable windows, although in this case there is one, there are actual drip edges but the drip edges were totally ineffective. Um, other areas he used steel included the, uh, the uh, supports for the step canopy that goes up to the guest house. But uh, the, the real issue was that you're in a totally, uh, really moist environment. I mean, it's, it's a marine environment. It may not be seawater, but it's water all over the place. And the way the building is designed with the, the edges of the slabs being semicircular, it leads the water right back into the head of the, of the windows and the doors, and the drips don't do anything. So this was kind of the condition we found the house in uh, when we started working there in, in um, uh, 1989. And we spent about five or six years uh, being like the Dutchman putting their finger in the dike, trying to stop leaks, testing out prototype uh, constru uh, patching and, and materials to fix the building. And um, we also tested out ways to repair the steel. And eventually we wound up doing a preservation master plan and a conditions assessment. And then we went on to do uh, four years of um, interventions that restored the building. So the, uh, we're looking at the stairs of stream, very iconic element, and here we have mild steel, which penetrates uh, each tread twice, each strap penetrates the tread twice, and uh, this was like the impossible situation. So we tried trial applied patches, we tried uh, port in place patches, they all failed. This, the, and we, we definitely cleaned the metal to bright metal prior to doing any of the patching, but it failed. It's just the, the situation was that the, the staircase gets partially submerged every time there's a flood, and it's pretty frequent actually there. So this was not going to work. On the other hand, at the, uh, so we had you know steel windows, steel doors, some steel elements, 
very poor uh, condition at falling water. But we had a, a house museum which left the windows and doors open half the year. Whenever there was good weather, the house has been mandated, part of its presentation and interpretation, is to show it how the people live there. The Kaufmans lived there, they lived there with the windows open. They didn't close the doors and windows when it was nice weather. So that's the way it's treated, even though there is some significant artwork from their collection in that house, including Picasso and two Diego Rivera's. It's not treated as a museum environment. The exact opposite is the case with the Guggenheim. The Guggenheim has a constant relative humidity interior environment of 50 to 60 percent. So how do you deal with that when you have single glazed steel windows and doors again? And these were in incredibly good condition, but I think you can see from this photograph unbelievable condensation, unreal amounts of condensation. Water ponding on the ceiling, water ponding on the floor. No visibility whatsoever of Central Park. Remember that Frank Lloyd Wright, well known for his organic architecture, inside, outside, all one environment, bring the outside inside. Where do you see the outside here? In fact, these rooms were rendered, this is the, what they call now the townhouse or pavilion, once was known as the monitor, rendered completely unusable during the winter and part of the time during the summer. Totally unusable, had to be blocked up. Okay, I'm, I swear to God that reflection on the ceiling is water, water. So here we had perfectly good steel windows. I mean, they were in perfect condition, but a totally unusable situation. So let's talk just for a minute theory. And we, we heard Gunny mention the key works of modern architecture by Frank Lloyd Wright. 10 iconic sites that is going to go forward and be presented uh, at the World Heritage Committee this summer in Germany in um, July, I believe, the World Heritage Meeting is. And it's the nomination from the U.S. And what we need to think about is how our treatments, which I'm going to talk about in a second, impact outstanding universal value which is how you get on the World Heritage List. What does OUV mean? It means cultural and or natural significance, which is so exceptional as to transcend national boundaries and to be of common importance for present and future generations of all humanity. This is the World Heritage Convention. It was, became a convention in 1972. It did not have operational guidelines till 1977. So the first things that were put on the World Heritage List were not actually designated until 1977. So um, there are 10 criteria for designation. Six of them relate to uh, cultural sites. Four of them relate to natural sites. And of course, you can have a combination of both in the case of cultural landscapes. Um, the nomination for Frank Lloyd Wright uh, uses criteria uh, one and two. So we have criterion one. This is to prove you have outstanding universal value. Criterion one is it represents a masterpiece of human creative genius. And in the nomination, they talk about the symbolic forms expressing function as justification for criterion one, and dynamic space and form, and also organic expression. The second criterion that this is being nominated under is exhibits an important interchange of human values over a span of time or with a, in a cultural area of the world on developments in architecture or technology, monumental arts, town planning, or landscape design. And here the justification is adaptation to modern requirements and organic influence. You also, in order to get on the World Heritage List, you also have to pass the test of authenticity, which in 1977 was, was described as meeting the test of authenticity in design, materials, workmanship, and setting. This comes straight out of the Venice Charter's monumental Eurocentric approach to cultural heritage. So 1964, 1977. By 1994, and again, 
Kani alluded to this with the Japanese temple, there was something called the Nara document on authenticity because there was so much um, concern from member uh, states or state parties as they're known, members of the convention, about not meeting the test of authenticity when it came to wooden architecture. So for ephemeral materials, this doesn't work. The materials, design, workmanship, and setting. Instead, the new passing the test of authenticity as a result of the NARA document, which are now part of the appendices of the World Heritage Operational Guidelines, is form and design, materials and substance, use and function, traditions, techniques, and management systems, location and setting, language, and other forms of intangible heritage, spirit and feeling, and internal and external factors. There's also the test of integrity, which means that it, the property must contain all of the elements necessary to express its outstanding universal values. So I'm gonna ask you to remember this and the fact that the, the definitions of authenticity have changed and evolved, and then the criteria which were selected to designate um, the key works of Frank Lloyd Wright, of which Falling Water and Guggenheim are two of the 10, and then think about how we intervene, of course, long before we knew that these buildings could potentially end up on the World Heritage List. So let's go back to Falling Water. As I said, the mandate of the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy, who owns the building since the early 60s, is to show the building as it was lived in. So despite the deplorable condition of the um, steel windows and doors, including this hatch to the stream, which was so corroded that it was actually immovable, for decades until we had it restored. Um, there was no question in our mind that this building, which is totally a Frank Lloyd Wright building, and the only changes that were made to the building were made by Frank Lloyd Wright himself within three or four years of the construction of the main house, the guest house was constructed. So basically, with the exception of the carports which were converted quite sensitively into uh, a kind of lounge for visitors at the very end, and they give you the spiel, donate money, of your tour, um, nothing's happened to alter the site. So we have pristine authenticity, in a way, of at least the architect's concepts and, and a lot of the original materials are still in place. So we, we brought out uh, from, I, it's, uh, I can't remember where this guy is based, Seekercher, do you, Bob? Jane County. No, he's actually to Scarsdale, or Peekskill, yeah. Peekskill now? He moved recently, recently, last five years. Um, for me, recent. <laughs> and, and this is a picture of him, you know, 20 years ago, practically, doing the, the hatch to the stream, which was the litmus test. Could he fix this thing? And he fixed it so that you can push it with one finger. I mean, just incredible. It's all on ball bearings. Uh, he, and here he is looking much younger than he is today. <laughs> He also fixed the corner windows. And so we knew we had the right contractor. And in fact, about um, in 2002, he was hired and he did all of the windows and doors throughout the complex. And since then, they've been touched up in 2010. And I have to say that I go there every single year to bring my students, and I am quite impressed with the paint which is industrial paint, that it's held up so well. And here, here's the restored, by the way, um, hatch to the stream. Now, with the stairs of the stream, we had the other issue. We had the issue of how do you make steel not corrode when it gets submerged? Well, you can't. It's just an impossible fact. We were, with further research, we figured out that the stairs of the stream were not an original feature. 
they had been knocked off by a storm carrying debris in the 50s. So they were a reconstruction already. Then we felt a little better about it. It was like, phew, it's a reconstruction. We can do what we think we need to do. And in fact, Bob Silman's office designed the stainless steel straps that now support the stairs to the street. Getting paint to stick to stainless steel, as you well know, is not an easy feat. And we needed paint that was both submersible and non-submersible. And that was done. And again, it, it hugely successful. It hasn't spalled since, lo and behold. So that the, these have been completed over 10 years now. So I think we can safely say that they're going to remain and survive. Now, with the Guggenheim, we had really good material in excellent condition, but one that just was inadequate in terms of its performance for a world-class art museum. So we had to face the fact. In fact, we tried all sorts of things. We went through all kinds of testing. We looked at beefing up uh, the, the um, you know, in other words, pushing out sort of the layer of glass, putting in double glazing. But the long and short of it was that we had a, a non-thermally broken steel frame. And there was nothing we could do to get around it. So no matter what we tried and tested, we could not guarantee that it was going to work. And in fact, we, we were pretty certain it was not going to work. And we were also dealing with a building that the interior is designated as well as the exterior. And if you know anything about the New York Landmarks Commission, they're pretty tough when it comes to aesthetics of uh, designated sites. So they don't mind if you replace it with uh, aluminum as long as it looks identical. Well, we weren't about to go there. So instead, what we ended up doing is we went to several different manufacturers, and we finally came up with a manufacturer out of Torrance, California, who was able to do, who custom made identical windows and doors and replicated them in steel, because the only way you were going to get that incredibly thin profile was with steel, but thermally broken steel. So here's a case where the authenticity of usage took precedent over the authenticity of materials. And it was very uh, painful for us to make this decision. But it was inevitable if they were going to continue to use that space all times of the year. And if this was to be a world-class art museum, it could not have ponds of water sitting on ceilings and floors. It just it was just untenable. It just didn't work. And we ended up with the added positive effect that we've now reconnected the uh, townhouse or pavilion to the park across the way. So we, we've reinforced the organic nature of Frank Lloyd Wright's philosophy, which is part of the the criteria for nominating it to the World Heritage List. It's, this view was just impossible nine months of the year. And it just made no sense to live with the perfectly good material. Believe me, we, should, we thought about everything, including putting on storm windows, everything you can imagine to save this original material. But in the end, the thing that made the most sense was to replicate it. So I'm going to leave you with that idea, but also just to let you know that we had the same issue with the skylights. Now, the main rotunda skylight had already been replaced in 1992 with double glazed skylight. But around the perimeter of the building, on the rotunda, are unseen skylights that are below ley lights, which is what you see on the interior. And those things condense like crazy because, again, they were single glazed, uh, non-thermally broken steel skylights. We ended up replicating them in aluminum because they're completely invisible. But we used uh, basically the same concepts as he did. And now we don't have you know, ponds of water on the laylands. 
or uh, dripping in between in the interstitial spaces. And so this is what it looks like. Uh, yeah, I know, this little thingy here is supposedly a gutter. I don't know why Frank Lloyd Wright thought that rain was not so important. All of his buildings look notoriously leak, but um, that was his thing. Um, I think I took less time than I needed to, but this way maybe we catch up a little, so I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs>